Hi folks, how's it going? You're very welcome to another Saturday session of Junior Cycle History here at Exam Revision. So in this lesson, we're going to look at the fight for Irish independence from the years 1916 to 1923. So like these, this is our main events, 1916 Rising, the War of Independence, the foundation of Northern Ireland, the Anglo-Irish Treaty, and the Irish Civil War. Okay, so we have to examine the rise and impact of nationalism and unionism. Okay, now we're not going to cover the rise of nationalism and unionism in this topic. This topic is going to focus on the key events from 1916 to 1923. So the first event we're going to look at is our 1916 rising, and then and then we're going to go on to the the, the chain of events that followed after that until. Um, I suppose, the Anglo-Irish Treaty negotiations and the Civil War. So before we get started, guys, um, I'm just going to do a bit of an analysis on the junior cycle exam paper from 2022. An interesting question came up. So this question, OK, now, unfortunately, the junior cycle exam paper did not have marks beside the question. But this question here, write a short account of the Irish Civil War. All right. This question was worth a total of 18 marks. Now, unfortunately, guys, you didn't know that, um, or students didn't know that when they sat the exam, but it is worth 18 marks. Hopefully, the next exam will have the marks, the marks on the paper, okay? So, just going to go through, because it's an interesting question. So, what this tells me is that any of the events that we study over the course of this lesson, 1916, the War of Independence, the... Anglo-Irish Treaty negotiations and the Irish Civil War, any of them can come up in a, in a question like this, where it's worth 18 marks in total. So that's quite a long question. So you've got to be able to write an account of any of those events. You've got to be prepared to write an account of all of them, okay? Because this question specifically asked for the Irish Civil War. It didn't say write an account of, you know, one of the events over the course of uh, you know, the time 1916 to 1923, it said write an account of the Irish Civil War. So it was very specific in what they wanted you to do. So I'm just going to go down and uh, go through how this question was marked and what you need to be, how you need to prepare for the exam when it comes to looking at these major events. So simple, I suppose, explanation of the American scheme. Each valid, relevant and developed point is worth three marks. OK, so. Let's get our maths heads on here. What is 18 divided by 3? Well, it's 6. Okay. So what that tells us is that we need to have 6 developed relevant points to be guaranteed full marks on this question. At least 6. Okay. So I'm going to go through now what that might look like. So bear in mind, guys, you, you don't just talk about the, the course you know, the major events that happened during the Civil War, you will be awarded marks for talking a bit about the background and a, and a bit about the impact and consequences. So what I would do is I'd split it up into three sections. I would mention at least two developed points on the background or causes of the war, of, of the Irish Civil War. Then I would mention at least two developed points, okay, on the course and ending of the war, okay, so they're the events that happened during the war. And I would give two developed points on the impact and consequences of the war. Okay, so each developed point you give is going to be worth three marks. So if you're given two on the background, two on the course, and two on the consequences, you're going to get 18 out of 18. Okay, um, now, just to be careful. So they only awarded up to six marks for points on the background and causes of the war. So that's why I would not give more than two relevant points, okay, on this, because you can only get marked for two of them. You can only get six marks here, all right? But that's just a guide, guys, a simple guide, okay, as to how you can get full marks on this question. It's not, not all the marks are on just the course of the war. The marks can be divided across the causes, the course, and the consequences, all right? And this can be, you know, this template, you can, follow, you can use this template for any of the events if you're asked to talk about, give an account of the 1916 Rising. Absolutely use this template if you're asked to give an account of the War of Independence or the Anglo-Irish Treaty negotiations, you can use this template. OK, so guys, that's just a little explanation of the marking scheme and how it was marked on the re most recent and only junior cycle history exam paper. So I hope that was helpful, guys. 
Now we're going to jump right into our first event, the 1916 Rising. Okay, so um, before we go to the 1916 Rising, actually, I'm just going to give you a bit of an overview as to what's going to be covered. So learning intentions today, we're going to look at the cause, course and consequence of the 1916 Rising. We're going to look at the, the course and consequences of the War of Independence. We're going to look at Northern Ireland. Okay, so understand how and why Northern Ireland was created. We are going to examine the course and consequence of the Anglo-Irish Treaty Negotiations. And we're going to look and examine and understand the course and consequences of the Irish Civil War. So quite a lot being covered in this lesson, guys. Okay, but again, vital that we know all these events in detail because it looks like we could be asked to write an account, an 18 mark question on any of them. So guys, the first event is the 1916 Rising. All right. Now, we know in Ireland there have been, um, I suppose, a, a rise of nationalism and unionism kind of between 1910 and 1916. Okay. Now, you'll remember, think back to, to, to your lesson on the rise of nationalism and unionism that you would have done in school. So we know that John Redmond, who's the leader of the Home Rule Party, John Redmond successfully achieved a Home Rule Bill. Now, we know this Home Rule Bill did not pass. It was suspended because of the outbreak of World War II. And John Redmond earned, he, he sorry, not earned, I suppose, he, he pleaded with Irishmen. He encouraged Irishmen to join the British Army and fight in World War I because he felt if Ireland doesn't support the, the war effort on Britain's side, that could jeopardise Home Rule. But this was controversial. And this caused the Irish volunteers to split. Okay, so the Irish volunteers split into two groups, the national volunteers. And these were the men that followed Redmond. Okay, and these believed that, yes, we should support Britain in World War I because it would, ben it would benefit home rule. And a lot of the men in this section of the, of the national volunteers would join the British Army. Okay, and they'd fight in regiments such as the Royal Dublin Fusiliers in places like France and Belgium. Now, 11,000 of the National Volunteers, okay, refused to join. And these, these 11,000 were led by this man here, Owen McNeil, okay? And they wanted to stay back in Ireland and make sure home rule happened, okay? So these are members of the IRB, these would be members of the IRB, the Irish Republican Brotherhood, who would go on to organise the 1916 Rising. So... The IRB had a military council, okay, a military council. And this was made up of men who their saying was England's difficulty is Ireland's opportunity. So while England is preoccupied with fighting World War I, we are going to plan a rising, an uprising against British rule in Dublin. Okay, and the following men planned the rising. So these are members of the IRB's military council, Eamon Kant. Thomas Clark, James Connolly, Sean McDermott, Thomas McDonough, Patrick Pierce, Joseph Mary Plunkett, and Roger Casement. So the background to the rising guys. So what we're going to do now, what we're covering now, could go into an answer on on, on talk about the event, you know, um, I suppose course and events of the 1916 rising. Okay. So during World War One, the military council of the IRB, so the men we just looked at there planned a rising against British rule. The IRB said England's difficulty was Ireland's opportunity, referring to England's preoccupation with World War I. And the IRB needed weapons. They were not very well armed, so they needed weapons. You'll recall maybe um, in, a, in, in, in your school that the IRB had smuggled some weapons in during the host gun running, okay, but they needed more. All right. And they went to Germany for the weapons. So Germany, who would they were uh, uh, an ally of, uh, sorry, not an ally, an enemy of Britain. OK, and they were, you know, the old saying, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So they were more than willing to send us some weapons. OK. And this man here, Roger Casement, um, an Irish diplomat, he managed to secure 20,000 rifles and one million rounds of ammunition and 10 machine guns from the Germans to help with the rising. Now, interesting about these rifles, they actually weren't German rifles. They were Russian rifles that the Germans had captured from the Russians in World War I. So they're kind of like, you know, uh, secondhand hand-me-down rifles that we were getting. Now, the weapons were transported to Ireland on board the Odd. Okay, and this is the journey the Odd 
took. You might say it was a bit of an odd journey. Look at this, okay? All the way around here, okay? Up into the North Sea, down here at the Atlantic, and down into Kerry. Now, the reason why they took this route is basically to avoid British surveillance. There would have been British ships patrolling the seas around Britain and Ireland, so as to avoid them, okay? So the weapons are transported to Ireland on board the Odd in April 1916. Now, unfortunately, on April 21st, disaster struck. The Odd was intercepted by the British patrol boat. Now, the captain of the Odd decided to sink the ship. Okay, he scuttled the ship. So the, the, all the weapons were lost. And Roger Casement was arrested and sentenced to death as a result. So he was on board the ship. Okay, now... Owen McNeil, the leader, okay, of the Irish Volunteers. Now, he wasn't part of the military council, but what he, 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 he heard about this. And what he did is he sent out an order that all Irish Volunteers were to cancel, cancel all military exercises planned for Easter Sunday. Because he said, there's not hope arising can take place. We barely have any weapons. Okay. Now, the IRB's military council were determined to go ahead with the rising anyway. So the men I showed you, and, and those men would go on to sign the proclamation of the Irish Republic. And they decided that the rising should go ahead on the 24th of April, which was an Easter Monday. Okay. Now the problem was because Owen McNeil had sent out um, basically a message to cancel all, all military exercises around the country, that meant that the rising would only really be confined to Dublin. Okay. Apart from Dublin, the only really other area where major fighting took place was in actually in Ashburn County Meath. All right. So I meant the rising was going to be on a much smaller scale, which obviously would not be good. So on Easter Monday, about 2,000 rebels occupied key buildings in Dublin. Some of these, you might know, the General Post Office on O'Connell Street. By the way, it's, back then it actually wasn't called O'Connell Street. It was referred to as Sackville Street. We have Boland's Mill and the Royal College of Surgeons. Potter Pierce, so this man here, he stood on the steps of the GPO and he read out the proclamation of the Irish Republic. You've probably seen that document. Okay, he read it out in public, in full view of the public on the steps of the GPO. And he then ordered all his men to occupy the general post office. The rising was about to begin. Okay. So here we have an artist's uh, impression of what the, it was like inside the GPO. So, um. Britain, the British army who were, you know, who, who would have been occupying Dublin and Ireland at the time, they were surprised by this. OK, so it took them a few days to fully respond to the rising. So eventually the British began attacking rebel positions and they used a, a gunboat, the Helga. OK, and they brought it up the River Liffey to drop shells, to, to drop artillery onto the GPO. By the end of the week, the British had 20,000 soldiers in Dublin. So the British would have had soldiers stationed in the Curra military barracks in County Kildare. They also could have brought over soldiers from the likes of Manchester and Liverpool, which would have been a short spin across the Irish Sea. And what this meant is by April 29th, the rebels were heavily outnumbered. OK, um, Podrick Pierce eventually surrendered and the leaders were arrested. One mistake on the part of the rebels is that they kind of failed to control major communication links. And this meant that the British could basically send more soldiers to Dublin easily via boat and train. So just here, guys, I just have a little map of the kind of, I suppose, the, the, the different strong points during the rising. So the, the circular ones are the Irish Volunteers. OK, GPO, the Four Courts, South Dublin Union, Jacobs Factory, St. Stephen's Green, Boland's Factory, Northumberland Road. And the squares are British strong points, okay? Dublin Castle, Trinity College, for example. Um, you'll notice here, guys, this is the gunboat, the Helga. So it actually sailed up this direction of the, the River Liffey and was dropping shells on top of the GPO here, okay? So we know that Potter Pierce surrendered, all right? Now, the rising, it was a military uprising. So obviously there's gonna be impacts and consequences. So the first major impact of any war conflict is death and destruction so the rising resulted in death and destruction uh, we have over 250 civilians 130 british soldiers and 60 irish rebels were killed and much of dublin city center was totally destroyed again the british had artillery they had cannons they had the helga gunboat so they they, they were dropping shells 
in and around Dublin city centre. 15 of the rising leaders were executed. Okay, and this, these executions only stopped when, when John Redmond pleaded with the British Prime Minister to stop. So John Redmond, leader of the Home Rule Party. The British clamped down heavily on those suspected of being involved in the rising. So 3,000 people were suspected of taking part and they were interned. So this means that they were put in jail without any trial. 3,000 people. Many of these were sent to places like Frognac internment camp in Wales. Now, the problem with this was is you had loads of Irish men and some women who were, I suppose, suspected of being in the rising. And these are now put together in a jail where they could associate with each other freely. So naturally enough, anti-British ideas and, 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 and sentiments started to spread through those people very quickly. Um, martial law was introduced in Dublin and a strict curfew was imposed. So basically, like you had you, you had to be in inside by, by a certain time, I think maybe 7 p.m. And you could be shot on site if you weren't inside. So we have more results of the rising then. So um, there was a change in public opinion. So, for example, like you think about it, if you're a Dubliner and you were involved in the rising and all of a sudden over your Easter weekend or Easter week, there is a, a band of rebels, Irish rebels, causing violence and death and destruction. You're going to be pretty annoyed at those people. But people's opinion changed. So there's a change in public opinion. And this change from anger to sympathy and admiration for the rebels. And this was because the British began executing the rebels. OK, um, so as the leaders of the of the 1916 Rising were being executed, the public became outraged. A lot of them, most of them were executed in Kilnainham Jail in Dublin. So like people, they're actually executed in the courtyard there. And like it's outside. So people in Dublin could hear the, the gunshots every day. And um, yeah, it, it basically it meant that people began to really start to admire the rebels and it led to more resentment towards Britain. OK, um, the rising also led to the rise of the Sinn Féin party. Because they were wrongly associated with it. So at Sinn Féin, Arthur Griffith was the head of the Sinn Féin party. Now, Arthur, the, the Sinn Féin technically had nothing to do with the rising at this stage. But the newspapers wrongly called it the Sinn Féin rising. So th it meant that people began to support Sinn Féin. And Sinn Féin would eventually grow to become far more popular um, than the Home Rule Party. So Sinn Féin's rise continued because they wanted to gain full independence and not just Home Rule. So the Home Rule Party wanted to peacefully get Home Rule. Now, Home Rule didn't mean full independence by any means, but it just meant we'd have a parliament in Dublin. Whereas Sinn Féin wanted full independence from Britain. And people began to want this and support this. So Sinn Féin became popular. Another big thing for Sinn Féin was they successfully campaigned against conscription into the British Army. So the British were trying to conscript Irish soldiers. That means where you have to fight in the British Army during World War One. And Sinn Féin successfully campaigned against this. And again, this led to the further rise in popularity of Sinn Féin. So while the 1916 rising, it hadn't directly achieved its immediate goal of getting the Brit the British out of Ireland. OK, it set, uh, I suppose, in motion a chain of events which would lead to eventual Ireland getting some form of independence from Britain. The next major event we're looking at is the War of Independence. OK, so the War of Independence was a guerrilla war. OK, that word guerrilla war, that's a word some of us may know, some of us may not. A guerrilla war is basically like kind of a war where you, you use hit and run tactics. So the IRA, you know, were they, they would have been very small in comparison to the British military. So they used hit and run tactics. They would ambush the British. They would only they would only fight the British on their terms. So they would maybe hide in ditches and stuff, ambush British soldiers, ambush the RIC, the police force, and then run away. Okay. And they caused much, much damage to British forces during this war. So there's a guerrilla war between the IRA and the British forces. So guys, just so we're aware, the IRA, so the IRA was the Irish Republican Army. And the IRA basically would, would have comprised of many members of the IRB, um, some members of the Irish Volunteers who fought during 1916. Okay, now. The Irish, Civil, the Irish War of Independence, it officially began on the 21st of January 1919 when two IRA men, Dan Breen and Sean Treacy, they ambushed an RIC patrol. 
in a place called Solo Head Beg in County Tipperary. Now, this RIC patrol was carrying gelonite. Gelonite is like an explosives and they are going to a quarry. OK, so that was one of the major tactics of the IRA. They would attack, they would attack RIC. The, that was the Royal Irish Constabulary, the police force in Ireland. Now, they're a police force, but they like kind of worked on behalf of the Brits um, of Britain. OK, um, and, it, you know, these were soft targets. The RIC um, wouldn't have been heavily trained in combat, but they would have had a lot of weapons. So they were an easy target to ambush many RIC barracks and, and police stations were ambushed because they often contain weapons. So as we said, the IRA used guerrilla warfare, hit and run tactics against the British, and they often attacked, as we said, RIC barracks because these were lightly defended and they had weapons and ammo. Okay. Um, the IRA were organized into mobile local, local units called flying columns, which operated in the countryside. So like the IRA had a big advantage in that they would have known the countryside very well. So they would have attacked British forces, RIC forces, and then they would have, you know, maybe went into hiding very quickly and they were very hard to catch. This man here, Michael Collins, this is the first time we've mentioned him. So we probably all heard of Michael Collins. So Michael Collins became director of intelligence. He was also actually minister of finance for the, for the, the unofficial Irish government at the time. And Collins, so Collins would have fought in 1916, but it was, I suppose he really came to prominence after 1916 when he, he was made director of intelligence. So he did a lot of the organizing of the IRA and the guerrilla warfare and the flying columns. So Collins organized uh, a group called the Squad, and these were a specially trained group of assassins. And it was their job to target British agents and spies. And th they were a very significant group that we're going to look at now. So this here is the squad. These are some of the members of Cullen's group of assassins. OK, look like nice fellas, but um, they were ruthless assassins who were, you know, no problem with, you know, who, who were trained killers to kill, to kill for Irish freedom. OK, they were fighting. They were fighting for a cause for Ireland. So. It was very clear in Ireland that, that the RIC and the British soldiers, there were some a small number of British soldiers in Ireland at this time. But it was mainly the RIC, the police force, being attacked. And it meant that the British government had to do something in response. And what they did is they made the Black and Tan Force. OK, so the Black and Tan Force was made up of ex-soldiers, so ex-British soldiers who had fought in World War I. OK, and these were sent to Ireland and they were basically given a free hand to do what they want in Ireland. A lot of the time they drank, they were very drunk. A lot of the time they carried out horrible atrocities on the Irish population. They would fire pot shots at farmers working in fields. They would burn villages and towns down. Um, so they carried out very nasty attacks, often in revenge for IRA attacks. And they would usually target the civilian population. OK, um, and the reason why they're called the Black and Tans is because at the time there wasn't enough uniforms going around to, I suppose, give them a full police or military uniform. So if you look here, this is from the film, The Wind That Shakes the Barley. Their uniforms were a mixture of police uniforms and army uniforms. As well as the Black and Tans, there was a new division in the RIC, so the Royal Irish Constabulary, called the Auxiliaries. And they were, these were a really nasty bunch of fellas. OK, and the Auxiliaries were basically like, like the Black and Tans. They would have worn similar uniforms. And it was their job to carry out revenge attacks on local populations. So if the IRA flying columns had attacked an RIC patrol, the RIC would carry out some horrible revenge attacks. OK, an example of one of these revenge attacks was Cork City Centre was burnt, was totally burnt down by auxiliaries um, because of an IRA ambush on the same day. OK, so the entire Cork City Centre was burnt down. So really, really horrible um, response there to the IRA ambush. Probably one of the most uh, infamous and significant events of the War of Independence was the, was known as Bloody Sunday. OK, and again, this was uh, uh, an RIC, an auxiliary um, and black and tan reprisal, revenge attack for an IRA attack that had happened earlier that day. So on the 21st of November 1920, Michael Collins and the squad assassinated a group of British intelligence agents. Uh, these intelligence agents were known as the Cairo Gang. 
they are called a Cairo gang because they served in, in Cairo in Egypt. Okay. Now, in retaliation, the RIC and the auxiliary forces um, went to the Crow Park during a match. So if you remember, Dublin and Tipperary were playing against one another in a game, uh, a challenge match, okay, Gaelic football. And the RIC and auxiliary forces opened fire on the crowd and they killed 14 people. And this became known as Bloody Sunday. Just indiscriminate firing in on the crowd. They they, they blocked off the gates, stopped people from um, escaping. So really, really nasty, horrible retaliation. Just, you know, murdering people in cold blood who were just out on a Sunday uh, enjoying a game of football. So by 1921, by the middle of 1921, I should say, um, we are nearing the end of the War of Independence. So firstly, the IRA had lost many of its members because they'd either died or were in prison. You know, so the IRA was a small guerrilla force. As well as that, the Black and Tans and Auxiliaries, we know that they were carrying out brutal attacks on the Irish population. Like, you know, word of this spread and it resulted in serious international criticism. So countries, other countries like America, for example, were saying like the, the Brits, like, what are you doing? You're, you're murdering civilians. You know, this has to end. OK. And eventually, on the 11th of July, 1921, um, the British Prime Minister, Lloyd George, this man here, and Eamon de Valera, this man here. OK, so he was the, I suppose, unofficial president of Ireland at the time. They called a truce to end the war. OK, so. The result of that truce would be the Anglo-Irish Treaty negotiations. Now, before we go into those, another significant event happened around this time. And it was the, the foundation of Northern Ireland. So Northern Ireland is a state that still exists to this day. Um, now, Northern Ireland today is probably about, I think there's a slight majority. There's 51% Catholics, 49% Protestants. But back in 1920, it would have been different. They would have been maybe like 70, 75 percent Protestants and maybe 25, 30 percent Catholics. So what they did, the British government founded a new state up here that would be part of Great Britain because the, the British government said that the majority of people in, in this area, in the northeast of Ireland, are Protestant and consider themselves to be British. So this led to what, something called the Government of Ireland Act in 1920. So under the Government of Ireland Act, Ireland was partitioned, okay, or divided into two sections. Um, parliaments were established in the north and eventually later on in the south, which we'll look at. And these parliaments would control internal matters, um, but ex external stuff like trading, for example, these would be dealt with by Westminster in London. Okay, now this partition was controversial and it resulted in violent clashes up, up north between unionists and nationalists. So a lot of unionists would have attacked nationalist populations up north. A lot of violence, a lot of nationalists burnt out of their homes um, because of, I suppose, the sectarianism, um, you know, hatred and, and prejudice due to, due to one's religion as a result of this. So this was a very controversial impact. And, you know, obviously we know the foundation of Northern Ireland is as a result of British conquest and colonization during the Ulster Plantation. And, you know, it's very interesting, guys, I suppose, because you think about it like, you know, this has resulted in the Troubles, which, you know, occurred throughout the late second half of the 20th century. And, you know, it's interesting because like, there's talk now about a, a potential referendum for the North to rejoin the South as a, a unified 32 county republic. Um, you know, and that's something that you guys will probably have a say in or, or will see in your lifetime. So it's just it's interesting how something that happened in the early 1600s led to the creation of a new country, which might, you know, impact your future as well. So around the same time as this, guys, we have um, the Anglo-Irish Treaty. OK, so again, the Irish Civil War ended. Or sorry, the Irish War of Independence ended. OK, a truce was called between British Prime Minister David Lloyd George and Eamon de Valera. OK, and there was negotiations between Sinn Féin and the British government, and they began on October 1921 on basically what to do, what to do, what was to be done next. OK, um, and both the British government and Sinn Féin had different aims. So the Sinn Féin delegation, the Sinn Féin negotiating team was Arthur Griffith, Michael Collins, we can see him here, Eamon Duggan, Robert Barton and George Gavin Duffy. 
Now, Eamon de Valera, who was the president of Ireland at the time, he did not attend the negotiations. This is very controversial. Eamon de Valera was seen as the man in Ireland. He was the, the, the head of the Irish state, I suppose, or, or you know, what we were at the time we call ourselves Ireland. Um, and, you know, like he would, would have been a strong negotiator, a good talker. So it was controversial that he did not go. Now, the aims of Sinn Féin were to achieve a republic free from British rule and end partition. So that was the main aim. OK, and these negotiations took place in London, by the way. So, guys, this is just um, uh, it's a throw it in here, an election poster for Sinn Féin. If you really want an Irish Republic, vote for Sinn Féin. OK, so again, just a little uh, slogan, uh, campaign slogan for, for the Sinn Féin political party. Another image of Michael Collins, uh, famous image of him taken in London, obviously a big, big grin on his face. Um, I'd love to know what the, what the joke was or what he was smiling at. But, uh, you know, it's interesting. It gives you an idea of Collins' personality. You know, this is during such a tumultuous time. He's negotiating the future of Ireland. You know, most of their leaders would be would be tense and, and, and on edge. But Collins is, you know, he's a very relaxed demeanor here. Um, you know, very, very, very cool image of Michael Collins. So the British delegation then, British Britain had a, a strong, formidable negotiating team, including David Lloyd George, Winston Churchill. So you probably heard of him. He would later become the British Prime Minister during World War II, Austin Chamberlain and Lord Birkenhead. And the aims of the, the British delegation were for Ireland to remain in the British Commonwealth. So Ireland would not, Ireland would basically stay in the British Commonwealth under British rule, essentially. So eventually, after tense negotiations, the Anglo-Irish Treaty was signed in the early hours of the morning on the 6th of December 1921. And these are the terms that both sides agreed to. So both sides, Sinn Féin and the British delegation, they had not fully achieved their aims, but they had kind of met halfway. So the south of Ireland would be renamed the Irish Free State. Um, however, Ireland would remain in the British Commonwealth. So that's significant. A big thing was Ireland would have its own parliament based in Dublin to look after internal affairs. So again, um, other affairs such as you know trade, going to war would be would be decided by the British government for Ireland. Okay. Um, the four treaties. This is a very controversial one. Irish politicians had to swear an oath of allegiance to the British Crown before dial meetings. So this is very controversial. Like. You know, Irish politicians, most of the Irish politicians would have literally fought in either 1916 or the War of Independence against British rule. So, like, why on earth should they take an oath of allegiance to a British king? That was particularly a controversial one. The King of e England had a representative in Ireland called the Governor General, OK, basically to keep an eye on what the Irish were doing. The British military would still have the use of three, what were nicknamed treaty ports. So there was, um, Three ports that the British military, British Navy could use, I suppose they were strategically considered to be important for Britain when it came to patrolling the Atlantic Ocean. And these were in uh, Cove, Bearhaven and Loxwilly. And a final major term is a, a boundary commission was set up and these would decide on the exact border between the north and south of Ireland. OK. Um. Just find it very, very interesting, I suppose, that, you know, Michael Collins, Michael Collins during the War of Independence would have been like the most wanted man in Britain, you know. Um, and now here he was literally in Britain negotiating with the with with the Irish, sorry, with, 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 the, with the British negotiating team with Lord Birkenhead, Winston Churchill, Austin Chamberlain, David Lloyd George, you know. Um, so it, it's really interesting when you think about it. And I, I wonder, I'd say a lot of the Brit, the part of that British delegation while they might have, you know, had a serious disdain or for Collins, you know, I'd, I'd imagine they surely would have had quite a bit of respect for him as well. Um, you know, couldn't help but have some kind of admiration for him, you know, for the cause he was fighting for. Um, so the Anglo-Irish Treaty, guys, was signed on December 6th, 1921. Now, this didn't mean that it was passed. This would have to be debated in the Dáil. So next thing, the Dáil debates the Anglo-Irish Treaty. OK, so 
there is pro and anti-treaty arguments. So those on the pro-treaty side, their argument was the IRA couldn't continue to fight the British military. Okay, so one of the threats from Britain was if you don't sign the Anglo-Irish Treaty, we're going to continue the war. Okay, and the IRA didn't have the weapons or manpower to keep doing this. Second pro-treaty argument, the treaty would act as a stepping stone towards full independence for Ireland. So it, Michael Hollins had a great quote. It doesn't give us full freedom, but it gives us the freedom to achieve freedom. Okay. Um, third argument, I suppose, rejecting the treaty would result in the renewal of war with Britain. So Britain would just would, would renew the war with the IRA and the IRA, you know, there's already enough death and destruction throughout Ireland and the IRA were not equipped to fight anymore. Michael Collins and Arthur Griffith were on the pro-treaty side. Now, what were the anti-treaty arguments? Well, the treaty had not achieved a full independent Republic of Ireland, which was the main aim of Sinn Féin at the time. OK, it was we want no less than a full independent Republic. Um, the treaty did not end partition. So Ireland remained partitioned into the north and the south. Another thing, and we mentioned this already, it was controversial. The anti-treaty side argued that Irish politicians should never have to swear an oath of allegiance to the British crown. Okay, these are men who have literally fought against British rule. We are not going to swear an oath of allegiance. Um, Eamon de Valera and Cahal Bruegge, so he was the Minister of Defence at, at the time, they were on the anti-treaty side. So Michael Collins, in my opinion, it gives us the freedom, not the ultimate freedom that nations desire, but the freedom to achieve it. So that was Michael Collins' view and opinion on the treaty. It's interesting because when he signed a treaty, he actually said, I've just signed my own death warrant. So, you know, the idea that he, he knew what was down the line, he knew this treaty would be controversial, divisive, and would, could maybe result in, you know, a civil war, which may lead to his death. So the Doyle debates the treaty, um, just very interesting image, guys. Like this was massive in Ireland. Um, you can see the huge crowds outside, um, standing outside the Doyle, waiting for the results of the negotiation. So on the 7th of January, 22, the Anglo-Irish Treaty was put before the Doyle. Okay? And the Doyle voted in favour of the treaty by 64 votes to 57. So it wasn't a landslide victory. There were still a lot of people, a lot of Irish politicians, did not or would not accept the Anglo-Irish Treaty. Now, probably the most important of these was Eamon de Valera. So Eamon de Valera resigned as president and walked out of the Dáil with his supporters in protest. So again, that's a big statement. The president of Ireland is literally resigning. He does not accept this treaty and he's resigning. Okay, um, so very, very controversial move by him. So this is an anti-treaty poster, um, like, you know, basically arguing that before the treaty, when we were fighting, we had more freedom, whereas now the full, this treaty has kind of brought us into the United Kingdom even more. OK, it's, it's just an anti-treaty propaganda poster. So the Irish, Anglo-Irish Treaty was so controversial that it would result in our next event, the Irish Civil War. OK, firstly, what's a civil war? Well, a civil wars are often extremely tragic because a civil war is a war between citizens of the same country. And this is what happened in Ireland. OK, a split occurred in Ireland. Um, basically, you had people who were pro-treaty and people who were anti-treaty. So those who were pro-treaty in favour of the treaty, these were formed into an official army called the Irish Free State Army. OK. And those who were anti-treaty became known as Republicans, or sometimes they are called irregulars. Okay, and like these both 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 of these sides would have fought together, um, as part of the IRA against British rule. Now they were fighting each other. Okay, so these once comrades would now wage war with each other over the treaty. Really tragic event. You've actually had a lot of families, like literally brothers and fathers in families who split over this. Some became anti-treaty Republicans, some became members of the Free State Army, and they fought against each other. Really, really tragic event, the Irish Civil War. So in response to the Anglo-Irish Treaty, the anti-treaty forces 
occupied the four courts in Dublin. And this was in protest against the treaty. OK, and they occupied the courts. They were led by a man called Rory O'Connor and they occupied the four courts. So that you can see it in the background there for a number of months. When on the 28th of June, Michael Collins. OK, so Michael Collins became the leader of the Free State Army. He was actually put under pressure by British, by uh, one of the Br British members of the negotiating team, Winston Churchill, to basically bomb bomb them out of the four courts. So you see, the, uh, this is the Free State Army down here, OK? Um, these guys here, and they, they're actually using artillery that was borrowed from the British Army, okay? And they shelled the four courts, and the anti-treaty forces surrendered just two days later. Now, quite tragic, this event, um, because the four courts contained a lot of really, really valuable sources, documents um, relating to Irish history that were lost, because the four courts went up in flames. It, it was, you know, went on fire, obviously, following the attacks and the shelling. So it was a really, really controversial event in that way. Now, most of the fighting of the Irish Civil War took place in Munster, in a place that became known as the Munster Republic. OK, so anti-treaty forces and the Free State Army fought mainly in the Munster Republic. So the anti-treaty IRA retreated into Munster and they basically made a number of strongholds, um, heavily defended areas in Munster. And what would happen is that the Free State Army would land by boat, land by sea and capture strong points in Kerry and Cork. So this is an image, an image of it here. Um, they would approach the coastlines around Kerry and Cork and, and troops would run off the boat and capture um, anti-treaty IRA strong points. OK, um, the fighting continued throughout the countryside. Now, again, tragic event. On the 12th of August, 1922, Arthur Griffith died of a brain hemorrhage. So Arthur Griffith, he was still ahead of Sinn Féin, but, you know, he wasn't fighting in this, OK? Um, now, just days later, Michael Collins, so Michael Collins, who we know was the, the, the general of the Irish Free State Army at the time, he was killed during an ambush at Bialnabla in County Cork, um, you know, in his home county. And he actually famously said, you know, he was advised not to go down to Cork, but he famously said, they're not going to shoot me in my own county. But unfortunately, he was killed. And, you know, Collins, like his death was mourned by people all over Ireland, not just the pro-treaty Free State Army, but the anti-treaty as well. Anti-treaty IRA, they mourned his death. He was such a great charismatic leader um, during the War of Independence. And I suppose his death kind of robbed Ireland of one of our future great leaders. So just looking here, guys, so this is what I mean by the, the Munster Republic. So in this area here, you can see, look, um, these are strong points here, these triangles, OK? And basically, the, the anti-treaty IRA blockade themselves in Munster. So the, the Irish Free State Army landed via boat to, to capture strong points. You might recognise the name of this boat here, the Helga. So the Helga, that was used a few years before by the British military to shell Irish volunteers in the GPO. OK, um, by the way, this line here became known as the, the Limerick Waterford line. So just an image here. So this, again, the first event of the Irish Civil War, the shelling of the four courts. And um, we can see here, look, uh, you know, how it caught fire. And unfortunately, many, many valuable documents uh, were lost. So the Irish Civil War, again, particularly nasty conflict. Um, eventually, in October 1922, the government passed the Special Powers Act, and this allowed the Free State Government to arrest and imprison IRA members without any trial. OK, and the Civil War would, would, would continue to, to, to rage or wage right up until May 1923, when eventually a ceasefire was, was, was called. Um, now, you know, again, one of the, the a major tragic event of this is Ireland, a lot of our you know, key leaders were killed. So leaders such as Cahal Brueghe and Liam Lynch on the anti-treaty side were killed. And Michael Collins, of course, on the pro-treaty side were also killed. And um, so really, really tragic that we kind of lost, I suppose, men who were considered to be probably the future leaders of Ireland in this conflict. And again, they were killed by their own side, essentially. OK, guys, so now we're going to look at the impacts or consequences of the Irish Civil War. Well, I suppose first two first impact was the formation of two new political parties. These are significant because both of these parties would dominate Irish politics for 
decades. In fact, they kind of, up until very recently, they still dominated Irish politics. I suppose now you have Sinn Féin are probably on, uh, just, just just as popular as them now. But these parties, so firstly, we've got the formation of Cumann na Gael, and these were, would later be called Fianna Gael, um, Leo Varadkar, for example, current uh, Fianna Gael leader. And these were, were these formed from the pro-treaty side. The second political party we have is Fianna Fáil, formed in a few years later now in 1927, but these are made up of the anti-treaty side and Eamon de Valera was the leader. Um, I suppose second major impact of any conflict is death and destruction. So there was much death and destruction in Dublin and Munster. Um, about 2,000 people were killed as well. So a huge number of people dead. You know, you think of Ireland, we've been through a seriously tumultuous time, a lot of death and destruction throughout Ireland, um, kind of between 1916 and the middle of 1923. Um, so really tragic stuff. The Civil War created a bitter legacy. And this bitter legacy is kind of as a result of atrocities carried out either side. So both sides would basically execute prisoners, you know, like they would fought with as much ferocity as they'd fought against the British, you know, and they would execute each other, uh, each other's prisoners sometimes in really nasty ways, you know, with, with landmines and stuff. And this, these atrocities basically poisoned Irish politics for decades. Okay. And again, wouldn't have helped Ireland move forward because of the bitterness that lasted. Um, a final one, I suppose, is we have a first official Irish Free State Constitution was eventually drawn up. It set up a civil service. It set up a new police force. Okay, so again, the RIC were gone. They were replaced by Angarda, Shiakana, and it also set up a system of courts. Okay, guys, a bit of a recap of our learning intention. So the course and consequences of the 1916 Rising. Um, to understand the course and consequences of the War of Independence, to understand how and why Northern Ireland was created, and to understand the course and consequences of the Anglo-Irish Treaty negotiations, and to understand the course and consequences of the Irish Civil War. So guys, just a bit of a, I suppose, just referring back to our exam question we looked at the start. So guys, I, I, what I would do, I'd really suggest you do, is practice writing out a sample answer for each of these events, particularly 1916 Rising, the War of Independence, Anglo-Irish Treaty Negotiations, and the Irish Civil War. Okay, because there's a very strong chance one of them may be on a junior cycle history exam. Okay, and again, use the format I gave you. So your, you know, your your two valid develop points on the, I suppose, causes, the two valid develop points on the I suppose the course, maybe, you know, three, three or four there even, and then maybe a couple of valid develop, develop points on the consequences. Practice writing out those answers. Okay, guys, thanks a lot for tuning in. Hope it was beneficial and we'll see you soon.